Thanks a lot. So thanks for inviting me. So I had forgotten that this is going to be uh, registered. So I had prepared some, a lot of very vague comments. But I didn't realize that all the stupidity that I'm going to say are going to stay. So that is a little bit embarrassing, but it's OK. So, uh, uh, so this is thought as uh, some kind of uh, uh, discussion uh, um, for uh, people that um, are uh, uh, more in probability than in dynamical system on how uh, uh, one can get uh, uh, the appearance of uh, noise uh, in, uh, de in deterministic systems. And uh, the issue, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, some wire. Okay. And uh, uh, what was I say? Ah, yes. And the problem is that, of course, in deterministic system, there is no probability a priori because the system is deterministic, right? And uh, yet, uh, although the law of uh, uh, physics uh, more or less are deterministic, we see a lot of uh, phenomena that are very well described by probability. Uh, theory, so one will wonder, okay, what's going on? So let me just give you a, a paradigmatic example of this thing. I think this is kind of reasonably nice, is uh, uh, in the work of, uh, 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 of uh, Bulimovic and Sinai, so one of the authors over there, for the Lorentz gas. So what is this Lorentz gas? Well, you have a periodic array of obstacles. Okay, so I am Italian, but I'm not Giotto, so my circles are not very good. But I mean, you have to imagine that these are circles. And in this, uh, so this uh, picture is meant to be in such a way that there is no trajectory that never hit an obstacle. So every, this is called the finite horizon property. It means that every trajectory after some time will hit some obstacle. And so the trajectory will look something like this. Okay, so they are just elastic reflection against the obstacle, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is uh, uh, the, tra uh, the trajectory. So you can write the trajectory x of uh, uh, t is just the position of the particle at time t. And uh, uh, the point is that uh, you expect that uh, this will, uh, for a long time, behave as a Brownian motion. So uh, that what you do, you just rescale it. And then what? Uh, so this was. Uh, 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 let me see, I forget, this was 81, I think. So this was in uh, so it's a pretty old result, it's last millennia, but uh, uh, this uh, uh, converges to Brown <laughs> So that is uh, converges in low to Brownian motion. But what does it mean here? Because as I said before, there is no probability. The point is that the position and the velocity at, the ti at time zero uh, are distributed uh, according to some random variable. So it means that uh, if you want the expectation of some function of the position of the velocity at time zero, this is just some x. D, uh, T, X, V, X, D, V. And this is a smooth function. So the idea in this paper is that the initial conditions are random. And uh, once the initial conditions are random, of course, this becomes a random variable. And you can look at this path. So this, this is, uh, uh, let's call it X, L of t, okay, so this is a path in uh, uh, the continuous function from some 0 to t. So you have uh, induced a measure on the continuous function, and this measure converts weakly to 
the measure of ground inertia. That, uh, so that, in some sense, uh, uh, I think is a, is a very nice uh, example, as far as I, as I know, is the first example of a really known uh, 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 totally deterministic system in which you get uh, uh, finally some behavior that uh, is uh, purely probabilistic. Okay. So you can, okay, there is uh, some source, in, in my opinion, there is some source of unhappiness about um, this result. And the source of unhappiness is the following, that, okay, fine, so you have this uh, idea that you have randomness in the initial condition. That's very, uh, that's very reasonable, but uh, what does it mean exactly? Because, okay, you can take the point of view that, well, uh, you know, maybe you don't know the initial condition, you know just that they are distributed in some way, and then uh, you will see but this uh, is kind of strange, right? Because, okay, you don't know what the initial condition is, but why the system cares if you, what you know about? So, uh, of course, if I start to do this uh, discussion, then I will start uh, talking about uh, Bayesian interpretation of probability, and that will never end, uh, and uh, I will probably say anything sensible. So, still, uh, I mean, uh, it would be, it is a fact that the system starts with some initial condition and does something. So, it would be more reasonable, I think, to get a result, for example, almost surely. And how can you get something almost surely in this context? So what I see two possibilities for uh, getting almost sure results. Uh, one is uh, the same problem that you have with Brownian motion. Like imagine that you are given just one realization of Brownian motion. And now you see this realization. How do you decide that it's Brownian motion? But it's just a realization. Also, it just goes there, it goes here, it goes somewhere else. And so uh, there is no probability. But what you can do, you can just uh, try to uh, look at the statistic of this path and see if the statistic of this path is it's the statistic, correct statistic of, of, of the Brownian motion. So you can, you have uh, your uh, uh, x, uh, uh, in my case, uh, you have your L, uh, this one. So you can take, for example, this plus h minus x l t, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, you take t i, and let's say that t i, uh, there are some times such that uh, uh, t i plus 1 is bigger than t i plus h, okay? So it's just, you have some trajectory, and then you take all kind of increments. So you take an increment of length h along this trajectory, and then you take the average, okay? And then, of course, you expect this. Uh, th now, this is just, uh, in principle, is, this is just the law of large number. So this should indeed uh, go to the expectation of uh, uh, H. Okay. H. This is zero, by the way. But I mean, you can take a function. So, so that, I mean, of course, that, that happens in the, uh, in the limit in which n goes to infinity and also l uh, goes to infinity. So if, if, if this is just Brownian motion, then it's, you, you just take this limit for n going to infinity, and then you get, uh, by the law of large number, the, that uh, almost surely for almost all uh, trajectory of, of, the, of the Brownian motion. So, and then of course uh, you can do other things, like instead of taking uh, this function, you can take the function of two increments and then uh, you compute the various statistics. And of course, it seems to me that any reasonable experimentalist, if one see, uh, if, uh, see some path and then start to do these statistics and see that they are the statistic of Brownian motion, then it would be convinced that he's seeing Brownian motion, even though he's just seeing one realization. Yeah? <coughs> Sorry, I didn't understand. <coughs> if you fix L, L. yes. Uh, if I fix L, it means that 
I, I, I'm just, uh, I, I did not rescale yet, right? But I think you know, that the, the, the order of limit is kind of important, right? So you have to take the limit n and l, they must be connected together. Here, I'm I'm, because otherwise you, you can see something different, yeah? So I don't think. Yeah, then you will see. Yes, the, then the limit will depend on L, but I, I, it's not going to be. Uh, so then it's just uh, you can. It's just the invariant measure of the system, right? Which is Lebesgue. So it's not the right answer. I mean, the right answer. No, what is the right answer? But. So, uh, so there is a problem here, I think. The problem is, is the following, that um, when you say, you see, I, I'm trying to say that now there is no probability anymore, but it's not really true, because when I say almost surely, it's almost surely with respect to some probability measure. Now, of course, if uh, uh, I look almost surely with respect to Lebesgue, then uh, that is what you are saying. But the point is that, why Lebesgue? There are other probability, invariant probability measures, right? So I haven't really, I mean, I don't know. It's not that uh, I have taken probability away from the picture. I'm just saying there, are, uh, there is one invariant measure that I like particularly for some reason. I mean, okay, it's just a matter of, uh, this is almost sexual preference somewhat, right? So I like the bag, and, and with respect to the bag, you, you get this. If, but you could imagine that you start from a different uh, initial condition in principle, because, uh, for example, imagine that uh, for a while you put uh, some kind of electric field, and then the, even starting from the bag, you will go to some different uh, measure, right? That will be concentrated in some other way, and now you start from that one as initial condition. So, okay, fine. But, uh, yeah. But in any case, I mean, I find this a little bit more, even though I don't think that this result was ever proven in, uh, for, for this system, but it seems to be well in reach of current uh, technology. And uh, I mean, at least it would kind of be an almost sure result, and then you can be unhappy about the, which, initial which invariant measure you are considering, yeah? You want to? You want to look at the, yeah, yeah, uh, no, 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 but you cannot go to a Gaussian distribution. This, this energy is, you go to the uniform, yes, 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 yes. You, uh, yeah, I don't think it's in this paper, but it seems, uh, yeah, it seems okay. It seems approved, okay. Yeah. The, the problem is that, of course, uh, uh, if you want Gaussian, then you, you have to be in the canonical. Here we are in the microcanonical. So okay, so this is just these are just um, kind of ideas on which I, I will not really I will not really discuss. But it, it seems to me that these are issues that are not really uh, very much discussed, uh, uh, at least not by people in dynamical system, maybe people in statistical mechanics. Yes, but and maybe some maybe one should write at certain point a paper discussing such things. But in any case, I mean the, the other possibility is that. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, you know, possibility one to get rid of of, uh, of uh, this uh, initial uh, probability, and pro possibility two, it is just to think uh, like that. Uh, okay, look, I mean, there are many particles, not one particle. Then, if you think that there are many particles, and uh, w and but the, so this uh, uh, initial uh, uh, probability measure. It's just a probability measure that describes uh, the bunch of particles that you have. So now you have n particles, and uh, you have uh, that uh, uh, if you, uh, you exactly uh, this stuff, so you get that the expectation of uh, uh, phi x i uh, di is this time zero, okay, uh, sum 
for i that goes 1 up to n, 1 over n. This, when n goes to infinity, tend to the integral, exactly to the integral over there. So this and this particle, we assume that they are independent. Then if this is the case, you have a bunch of independent particles, and uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, since uh, they are taken out of this distribution, then again is the law of large number, we get this, uh, this uh, fact. But uh, if you look at time t, now, well, if you look at time t, then again they are independent, because they were independent before, they are independent now, and then you get that they will converge to, so if you look at time t, then the convergence will, will be to some initial, to some other distribution, and the distribution, of course, satisfies, sorry, the heat equation. which is exactly what you expect, because this is Brownian motion, that is, is what uh, should happen. And, and now, since this is a low large number, then this happens almost surely. So it means that almost surely, if you look at this bunch of particles, for almost all the initial conditions, you look at time t, and you see that the distribution is the distribution that you would predict uh, by uh, heat equation. So assuming that they move as a, as a Brownian motion. This always after the limit L going to infinity. Here, always there is a question of, uh, I mean, here I'm taking first uh, the limit n to infinity, uh, sorry, um, first the limit l to infinity and then the take the limit n, n to infinity. So, you, uh, in reality, of course, the system are finite, so there is a big issue on what is uh, the right uh, uh, scaling that you, that you have to, to take. And, uh, but, I mean, at least uh, naively, this is uh, uh, a, a way in which, again, you get almost sure result. Of course, any physicist would be totally upset with this picture because, say, but look, it's completely ridiculous. These are independent particles, so you're just talking about a gas of independent particles. But what about if there is uh, also some very small interaction? I mean, can you say something about that? And the answer is no, but OK. Uh, but in principle, well, maybe it's, it's, it's an issue that uh, it is worth trying to study what happens when there is a very little, very little weak, very weakly interacting system. I mean, so there is some activity right now in dynamical system trying to look a very weakly interacting system, uh, hoping that uh, uh, something like that can be proved when also there is some interaction among the particles. But this is just, just uh, okay, dreams. Okay, so this, so that was just uh, trying to say a few things uh, as a motivation of what uh, I wanted to talk about. Uh, so in some sense, uh, what uh, I'm saying is that uh, the basic result that I would like to discuss is this type of result that is of in exactly in the style of this uh, Bunimovich Sinai paper, and uh, this issue of uh, uh, you know, what it really means to start with a random initial condition, I will not uh, discuss, but I, I just mentioned these two ways of uh, attacking this problem and trying to say something meaningful about that. I mean, but, okay, so now what I would like to discuss is, is this one, but of course I don't want to discuss this uh, exact problem because it's super uh, technical and uh, that would be, will require much more than uh, three lectures. Uh, so I will try to discuss it in a very simple situation, which is the most simple situation possible in which there is a deterministic dynamics that gives rise to, uh, uh, to some uh, probability behavior, probabilistic behavior. And uh, the idea is just to try to uh, show in this very, uh, simple dynamical system, uh, various techniques that can be used in order to obtain the central limit theorem, because this, after all, is, is a central limit theorem. And, uh, uh, and then uh, the point is that this technique, uh, I will try to present in such a way that, in fact, uh, the, although they are applied to a very simple case, 
the basic uh, strategy can be upgraded to more sophisticated uh, example. Even though I have to be honest with you, I mean, very little can be done in practice. So, I mean, it's, it's true that one can do more sophisticated examples, but, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we are kind of not very... Uh, ah, but uh, not, no, not very far ahead. But uh, first, first, uh, first uh, I would like to make a last general remark. And the last general remark is the following. You see, uh, in this uh, uh, game of uh, central limit theorem, uh, you, get, uh, um, you get, of course, that magic, it, it, it appears a Gaussian random variable, which is the Brownian motion. So, uh, one uh, may think that uh, this uh, is reasonable to ask, okay, uh, how well this limiting behavior describes uh, the behavior of the Lorentz gas. And uh, the question is that, uh, again, is a question of scales. Here you see, essentially, um, this is a good result up to time L square. But what about if you want to go for longer times? If you want to go for longer times, then essentially what you have to study, you have to study large deviation. Because, of course, if you look at very long trajectory, eventually you will see some large deviation. And now the question is, but the large deviations that you see, are they going to be the large deviation of the Brownian motion or are they going to be something else? That is, if you keep looking at the system, will you realize that it's not a Brownian motion or uh, not? I mean, for maybe, or maybe you have to look at absurdly long time to realize that. Of course, I mean, if you look at the system with a microscope and you see the particle going around, then, of course, you see that uh, it's not a Brownian motion because it goes in straight lines. But, uh, I mean, that, uh, that is somewhat forbidden, right? I mean, so you are not allowed to look at the scale one. So, but, uh, I mean, maybe this, this result, uh, also this, I don't think, has never been done, but it's very reasonable that can be upgraded to something like a, a local limit theorem. So if you look at uh, the distribution uh, on, a set, on uh, a region of size one, you still see the right thing that is predicted by Brownian motion. But of course, if you start to look uh, uh, inside the cell, that, then you will see, it, for example, that here there is never any, any particle because there is an obstacle, right? So, uh, so this is kind of uh, uh, forbidden, but, uh, but you can just look at uh, scale L or maybe a scale that is a little bit bigger than, than, uh, than one, maybe square root of L or something like that, and then you look at very long time. And then the question is that, I mean, still uh, what this convergence does hold in some sense for longer times or not? And uh, uh, so this also is an issue that I don't think has been investigated for the Lorentz gas, but it has been investigated for simpler system. And uh, I will maybe say something about it uh, in my last uh, lecture. But uh, the, um, uh, the issue is, is kind of, if you think a moment, you will see immediately that uh, the answer is that uh, you will see something wrong. You know? Because, for example, you look at the probability that x uh, uh, L t is bigger than some constant time t. Okay? Now, if uh, this... Uh, where Brownian motion, then this will be exponentially small just by large deviation theory. But since the particle has some velocity, if uh, they say that the particle has velocity one, I mean, is there is some distribution here, right? So, I mean, uh, let's say that the distribution for velocity, uh, it is, uh, I mean, here must be smooth in X, but not necessarily smooth in V. So you can take V equal one, that is okay. And uh, so if you, so that means that this, this uh, is not really a function, it's a distribution supported on this, uh, on this, set, on this set. So it means that the velocity is uh, uh, one, uh, and then it means that if C is bigger than one, this probability is zero, right? So that is a, a, a prediction that is different from, uh, from, uh, the, ah, sorry, there is some L that is missing here. Uh, no, I think it's okay. Uh, so, hmm. Okay. 
Yes, because uh, I look at the time, I look at the time uh, L square and I divide, by, I divide by L, so at most I can, this, system, this guy in this time at, at most could get a distance L square, and so divided by L at most it gets a distance L. So if this, uh, T time L. So if this is bigger than one, then the probability is zero. But the probability of Brownian motion is just exponential, it's just e to the minus uh, L times something. So, so that, that's clear that uh, there is a, uh, a problem. So this uh, convergence will hold uh, in some uh, uh, time that probably is, is longer than, uh, uh, than L square, but uh, at a certain point things will break down and you will see that, uh, that uh, the system is not really a, uh, is not really a, a probabilistic system, but there is something, something else going on. And that, my impression is that it's more or less, uh, is more or less uh, uh, for this type of system, the general picture, I believe, is something like that. That if you look at central limit theorem, then it looks perfectly okay, like if it is a stochastic process. If you look at moderate deviation, still, it may be that you cannot distinguish, but if you look at large deviations, then you will see that there is a difference, and that is not a, a real stochastic process, but there is some, something funny going on. All right, so that is uh, more or less the end of uh, these general com comments. And uh, let me just describe to you the absurdly stupid class of examples that I want to discuss. So what is the key property that allowed uh, uh, these uh, people to prove this uh, ni very nice result on, on uh, Lorentz gas? The key property is what is called uh, hyperbolicity or uh, strong dependence from initial condition. The basic fact is that if you have a bunch of parallel tra trajectory that eat an obstacle, then since the obstacle is uh, convex in this case, then uh, this will, uh, after collision, will uh, be a diverging bunch of trajectory. And so if you have a distance here that is delta, this will grow and every collision will make it grow. So there is a mechanism whereby if uh, you have some knowledge of the initial condition, you follow the dynamics and you lose track of uh, the initial condition at an exponential speed. So typically, if you have two initial condition, uh, x, let's say, uh, let's call c the initial condition at time zero, and then you have another initial condition, c prime, at time zero, and the distance of this is delta, then you wonder what is the distance of this initial condition uh, at uh, uh, time t. And this typically you expect to be something like exponentially growing. Of course, uh, this is just infinitesimal, if these are very close. If they are uh, at a certain point when this is of order one, then it doesn't make any sense. But I mean, uh, for very close by initial condition, you expect that uh, you have uh, this exponential increase in the distance of two nearby initial conditions. And that essentially is the mechanism that uh, uh, substitute uh, the loss. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is essentially says that the system has some loss of memory somehow. I mean, the system is deterministic, so it has no loss of memory, right? If I know exactly the initial condition, I know uh, what will happen in the future, and if you tell me in the future where I am, I know where I was in the past, because this system is reversible. So uh, there is uh, no loss of memory, but the point of the loss of memory is the following. If you know the initial condition with some little mistake, then this mistake increases extremely fast, and after some time, you have uh, no idea where you started from. Because, so that is exactly uh, what happens for, uh, for example, weather prediction, right? I mean, now you do a lot of very complicated measurement of what is the weather today, then you write some very suspicious software that should predict the weather tomorrow and more or less it works. But if you want to know what will be 
the weather in a month, it is much more efficient to, to, to know that in a month it will be uh, what it will be uh, kind of July, and in July most likely there is sun, and that prediction is more or less as good as the one that you can get crunching number like crazy on this computer. Yeah? I didn't understand, sorry. No, 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 Poincare recovery still has happened. Happen. First of all, this is an infinite system, right? So, and anyhow, Poincare recurrence happens on a time scale that is huge, super huge. So, it, it, it will never show up in this type of computation. It's true that there is recurrence, uh, Poincare recurrence, so everything come back. But as I said before, I am just looking at very, very close initial conditions. So, at, uh, when this quantity becomes of order one, then, of course, this is not true anymore. Okay. Yes, this two will return in different times. That's right. So that is, uh, well, uh, unless they are uh, super, super close, then, but then they yeah. measure, yeah. But uh, when they return. This probability is zero. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, all right. Uh, now, um, so this is the basic mechanism, and that if you want to make a simple uh, uh, dynamical system that, uh, for which you want to prove this type of result, then you need this mechanism. If you don't have this mechanism, then uh, it's, uh, nothing will work, right? So the simplest situation in which you have this mechanism is a map of the circle. So you have a map of the circle, which is not invertible, so you may be unhappy because, uh, because uh, the system I started from is an invertible system, and the map of the circle may not, uh, that I'm going to consider is not invertible. But this is not really a big problem because, I mean, I could make a, a map of the torus that is invertible, but this will just add extra technicalities that do not really, I will comment on that later on. So let's start with the possible, uh, simplest possible situation. So I get a map of the circle with the derivative strictly bigger than one. Okay? So uh, example, totally absurdly stupid example, is 2x mod 1. Okay? That is uh, this in, in general. And then also I want f in general to be smooth, so of class C2, let's say. So there is some activity in dynamical system trying to find what is the minimal smoothness that make the game work, but honestly, I don't see what the point is. Because I don't know of any example in which this uh, is really relevant. I mean, maybe there is some. Well, yeah, maybe there are some examples in which this is relevant. But, but anyhow, I mean, this is not. Uh, something I want to discuss on. So I just take C2, or you want to see, ah, oh, let's oh, forget it. That's it. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean. All right, so now you have uh, this very simple case. And this, of course, has uh, the properties that you have, that, that you want, because if you take two points, uh, then you iterate with this map, and for some time, they will diverge exponentially, right? If you near two nearby points, since the derivative is bigger than one, so Fn x minus f and uh, y, okay, this, it is the integral from x to y of the derivative c dx, and then uh, since this is uh, uh, bigger than lambda, it means that the derivative of uh, the nth the iterate of the map is bigger than lambda to power n, so this is bigger than lambda to power n x minus y. I mean, I, I, unless, unless, of course, uh, you start to loop around, so, uh, because this uh, is mod 1. So, so if, if these two points are still at a distance less than 1, then this computation is correct. And so it means that the two points separate exponentially fast, which is exactly the property that I mentioned before, holds for the Lorentz gas. 
okay, very well. So now I have such a system, and uh, given such a system, I want to see if I can say something. So of the type that I have discussed before. So of course, of course the simplest possible case is just to take a function phi and then uh, so you take a function phi and then you take uh, one over uh, uh, so the first thing uh, that you want to do of course is the law of large number because the dynamic now what it looks like now the dynamics is the following So this is the dynamics, it's just given by this map. So you take an initial condition, you apply the map, this is where you are at time one, you apply the map, that is where you are at time two, and so on and so forth. And now that you have that, you want to look at uh, <coughs> uh, the behavior, or you want to study the statistics of this trajectory. So in principle, you can uh, do what uh, I did before, you can create uh, Z, L, T as, uh, um, uh, sorry, sorry, okay. Now you have an observable phi, and now you have phi xn, and these are your uh, variables. So this is what it is. This is the equivalent of an increment in the Lorentz gas, going from 1 to 2, uh, the next obstacle, you just move in space by something, okay? And if you want to find the position, that is what I was looking at, you have to take the sum of this object. So the sum of this object will be sum from i that goes from 0 up to n minus 1 of phi of xi, and this is my variable uh, z uh, n. Oh. Uh, this, so you are, I have to interpret this one as the increment in my walk, let's say. Or if you want, if you want really to have a random, okay, maybe you want really a walk. Okay, if you really want something that looks like a walk, then you have Z T. And this, you have some parameter, uh, let's call it epsilon, just to make it. And then here you have epsilon, and then here you have epsilon minus 2 uh, t minus 1. Okay, and that is, uh, that is uh, a path. That uh, this is the object that I want to study. And that is exactly the same that I had before. If I interpret this as being the increment of my x of the position from one obstacle to the next, then the position is given by the sum of all these increments. And in a time, and I rescaled exactly in the same way before. What before it was called L now is epsilon minus one. Sorry. So this is the quantity that I would like to, to study. So essentially, if you take, uh, 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 so let me just study, instead of studying this as a path, let me just look at uh, uh, Z epsilon uh, one. So just at time one, what happens? So I have just to look at uh, epsilon sum for N for I it goes from 0 up to epsilon minus 1, minus 1, uh, minus 2, sorry, of phi x. 
So, I mean, of course, uh, this one is not necessarily an integer number, so I mean, forget about that. I mean, this, imagine that epsilon is 1 over L. Okay, so that is uh, the quantity uh, I would like to, to study. But of course, uh, I mean, uh, there is uh, some uh, basic fact you know, that probably the first quantity that you want to study is this one, which is just the average. Because in the Lorentz gas, it happens that the increment has zero average. Okay, that's why you can, but in principle, if I take some arbitrary function phi here, there is no reason why this uh, should be zero average. And then also there is the question of zero average with respect to what? What is the measure? So, again, uh, there is the same problem as before. We have to know which measure we are talking about. We want to do exactly the thing that has been done before. The point is that uh, x0, the initial condition, should be distributed according to some uh, measure. Uh, and uh, what... Uh, what, uh, uh, what I will do, I will take the situation in which uh, uh, the uh, x, so the expectation of uh, some function of x naught is equal to the integral of rho x phi x dx where rho is C1. Okay, that is again a matter of, uh, again, sexual preference. I like Lebesgue. So, but, uh, okay. so this means that the initial distribution is, this, the initial condition is distribution, distributed arbitrarily, but smoothly with respect to Lebesgue. And this is a probability measure, right? So. Okay, in principle, you can start with a different initial uh, measure. So you could start, for example, with a delta function. But then, uh, if you start with the delta function, it's a catastrophe, because it means that you are starting exactly with, uh, uh, I mean, there is no probability now. You start with an exact initial condition, so there is no hope that you can prove anything. So it's clearly that the class of measure you started with makes some difference. But, uh, okay, let me just come back uh, later on, on that. So now this is my this is my choice. So now you would you want to study this type uh, of uh, problem, and in order to study this type of problem, uh, what do you expect? Well, you expect that if uh, this uh, uh, random variable now it's a random variable because, I mean, it has uh, some distribution. Uh, so if random variable, uh, maybe it will go to some special measure. And then if it will go to some special measure, then you expect that this will converge to this, to the average with respect to this special measure, right? That it will be. That is some, uh, and, and then, and then if, you, if this is zero, then you can look at the central limit theory. So that is the first problem that uh, you need to, uh, to attack. And, uh, and that requires a little bit of, of, um, uh, of work. Hmm? No, but yeah, but that, is a, that, that will happen almost surely, because it's a, it's a local. Yeah, I mean, there is epsilon squared. This, this is a law of large numbers, so, I mean. So let me just start to discussing this, because if we do not know how to handle this, there is no way we are going to handle uh, anything, right? And uh, so there is a basic uh, paradigm that uh, I think that nowadays people use when uh, trying to study the statistical property of dynamical system, and the paradigm is that uh, uh, it is a Markov chain. Okay, it's maybe it's a degenerate Markov chain, but essentially it is a Markov chain. So the idea is that try to do the same thing that you do for Markov chain, and uh, if you can set up the business in such a way that things look like a Markov chain, then you have an industry, which is the industry I'm going to discuss in this uh, 
lectures, which is the following. Look at what people do in Markov chain and copy without any shame. Try to just see if it works in the same way. So, uh, so that's the first uh, problem that I want to discuss, is that in which sense I can uh, uh, discuss this as a Markov chain. So the idea is the following. I want to look at, so in a Markov chain, what there is. There is some kind of matrix that tells you the transition probability. And so I want to have some object that is called the transfer operator, which does the same in this case. So what do I have to do? I have to do the following. I have G, uh, and then I have phi composed F, which is my dynamics. And uh, I want to, so this is on the unit torus, and I want to write this, so this, oh, sorry, let me call this rho, okay? So this is the density and this is the thing, and I want to see what is the density at time one, okay? This is the density at time zero, what is the density at time one? So what do I have to do? I have to change variable, okay, I have to change variable. So problem is that this is not invertible, okay? And then you have to do this computation uh, dividing the torus in the domain of invertibility, in each domain of invertibility you change variable, and you get, if you do that, you get this formula. I mean, this, I leave it to you if someone wants to do it. I leave it to you as an exercise to do this change of variable. And the answer is the following. So this is the answer. I mean, this is just the Jacobian of the change of variable. And of course, since you had to divide the interval in the, the tall, oh, sorry, this is one dimension. You have to divide the circle into the domain of invertibilities, and you have a certain number of domain of invertibility. Every point has a certain number of pre-images. For each pre-image, you just sum the value of the density at that pre-image, but there is this factor that comes from the change of variable. So this is just a trivial, totally trivial computation that uh, if you don't believe, you can do it by yourself. And so uh, it means that it is a good idea to introduce this guy. So these things become simply so that is uh, essentially what the dynamics does to density. If you have a density, if you have a probability measure that is described by a density, and you want to know that, and want to know what how is described the probability measure at time one. Then this computation tells you the probability measure at time one is still a probability measure with a density with respect to Lebesgue, and the density is given by this operator applied to that. So now you are more or less in a situation very similar to a Markov chain. What you have to understand is the operator L, right? Because now you want to look, what do you want to do? Let's say that I want to prove this law of large number. So what do I do? Well, I do. I compute the L2 uh, uh, so I want to compute somewhat the distance in L2 to, from this and this and, uh, and then apply Chebyshev inequality. That's what everybody does, right? So the only thing that I need to know is who is this. Okay. So uh, in order to know what is that, I can just uh, integrate. with respect to the initial condition. So I take the average. Okay? And then, of course, the average should converge to this, right? So I have to compute the average. Okay, but this is. Because 
is just this one, and then uh, you keep iterating this thing, and then it means that the at time, the distribution at time n, it will be just the operator L at power n applied to the initial distribution. So that is the stupid formula that everybody that have ever done a computation in Markov chain and recognize it. And then the question is, does this converge somewhere? If this converges to something, then I know that it will converge to the density of some measure that is the invariant measure, which is this guy over here. So everything boils down to try to understand the uh, property of this operator. So there are some uh, general trick that, uh, yeah? I have no idea at the moment. That's what you have to prove. If, if this converges to something, then it will converge to a density that is the density of an invariant measure. That is the, this one is a function, right? OK, so the question is, does this converge to some rho star? If it does, then this will converge. Then, I mean, if this converges to some rho star, this is an average. So this will converge to the limit, right? So then it means that this will converge to rho star x, p, x, dx. So it means that this mu, it is just a measure with density, and density is rho star. Yeah, what about if my grandmother has wheels? I understand it doesn't happen. Yes, if it converts to a delta, then it would converge to a delta, yeah? I mean, that's, I don't know what it converts to. That I haven't discussed yet. I'm just saying, if it converts to something with a density, then you get this. If it converts, if it does not converge, it could be that it does not converge at all, right? Why should it converge? That's correct. It's not, nothing is clear at this moment. Yeah, that requires some. Because, I mean, for Markov chain, this is just a matrix, right? So a matrix, you know that uh, what's going to happen. There will be a maximum eigenvalue. If the maximum eigenvalue is simple, then everything is obvious. But uh, now you look at this operator. Does this operator have a maximum eigenvalue? I don't know, because you see, there is a simple computation that is a little bit disheartening, which is, uh, the following. Uh, imagine that. Imagine that I compute the L2 north. Uh, wait. Huh? Yeah, uh, let me consider this other case, right? Imagine that you have, now because this is a little bit, I, I mean, the computation would be a little bit more complicated because there is this sum, it is not, uh, it is not uh, invertible. But imagine that you do instead the, the same argument with the map from the tutorials to tutorials so that is invertible, okay? Then the transfer operates, so the map now is, for example, let's imagine that the map is x, y equal 1, 1, 1, 2, x, y, mod 1, OK? Imagine this case. And then you look, you do the same argument, and you discover that now the transfer operator, L, is equal, L uh, rho of x, now it is really simply equal to rho computed on the preimage. Why is that? Well, because you do exactly the same thing, and now the problem is that the preimage is only one, so this sum it has only one element. On the other hand, here, since now you do a change of variable in two dimensions, it will appear the determinant of the Jacobian. But the Jacobian is exactly this, and the determinant is one. So there is nothing, so that you just get this operator. And now, if you get this operator, you start, let me just do a computation of del 2 norm. OK, so this is, with this, notice that in this case, the back measure is invariant, okay? because the determinant is 1. So the back measure is invariant. 
So now I do the computation, I compute the L2 norm of this guy, and what do I get? I get that this is rho square, compute f minus one of x, dx, but the back measure is invariant, so this is rho square of x, dx. So the operator is unitary. If the operator is unitary, then the spectrum, it is just the unit circle. But if the spectrum is just a unique circle, the idea that there is a maximal eigenvalue is a little bit stupid, right? It's not, it's not going to happen. So it means that this idea that yeah, I look at the maximal eigenvalue of this operator for dynamical system, it may be a little bit naive. And uh, if, uh, if uh, you do this computation for this operator in L2, which is the computation is slightly more difficult, but I don't want to do, uh, you find the following answer. This is one, and the spectrum is this one. All the, 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 the whole disk is a spectrum of the operator. So this is the operator of L, uh, uh, sigma in uh, the spectrum in L2 of this operator is this one. So this takes a little bit more to prove, so let's, let's not me do it. Uh, but uh, now you look at this fact, and it looks like a catastrophe. Like you say, OK, I mean, then I mean, what can I say? I mean, it's just there is no maximum eigenvalue. So this is basically the problem that happens uh, that you, you, always has in, you always have in dynamical system. You have to get around this problem. You have an operator, typically, if you look at it in spaces that are, I mean, like, uh, people like very much, like it, L2, it, uh, it just the spectrum is bad. So the basic idea is that, okay, L2 is not the only space around. There are other spaces. So let's try other spaces. Maybe in some other space it will be better. That's, that's all. More or less, I have finished the course in saying this is this. Right? Then you have just to find other spaces. OK, so in this particular instance, it is, uh, so for this case here, it is a little bit complicated to find these other spaces, and I will mention it uh, later on. But for this case, it is kind of easier, because <coughs> look, uh, there is one basic computation that is the following. Let's look at what happened at the derivative, OK? So let me just, I want to compute uh, uh, the derivative of You see, that is why I ask rho c1. If you have an initial distribution that is only c0, then I am in trouble. I don't know what to do. Because uh, then it's, it's only c0, then I mean, I have this type of spectrum decomposition, and maybe it acts very badly, which is kind of reasonable because, as I said before, if you want to start with the delta function, that is a no-go because uh, it, there is no randomness. So you know that uh, some loss of memory comes from the fact that uh, if you don't know very well the initial condition, you will forget. But if you allow for an de initial density that is very wild, this allows allow you to say very precisely what is the initial condition, right? Because you can take a delta, some, not, not a delta function, but almost a delta function on, on some, uh, or maybe you can localize on a Cantor set or do some other weird stuff. And now, if you do that, it, you may see your choice of the initial condition for an extremely long time. And that will make all this, what I'm trying to say, empty. So you need some condition now, and the condition that I chose is this one, and this computation is going to show why this is nice, and the reason why it is nice is the following, that if I do this, then I have to do the derivative of this quantity here. So the derivative of this quantity, it will be a sum, of course. <coughs> So, okay, I have first to take the derivative of the numerator. The derivative of the numerator will be rho prime of y. But then I have to remember that I am taking the derivative with respect to x. So I have to take the derivative of y with respect to x. And since this is the inverse, it is just 1 over f prime. And so that means that here I will have square 
And then I have to take the derivative of the denominator. So the derivative of the denominator will be rho y. And then it will be this square. But then, again, I am taking this will be the derivative with respect to y. So now I have to take the derivative with respect to x. So it, this is another inverse. And now if you look at this, you can rewrite this stuff as uh, <coughs> L applied to rho prime divided f prime plus uh, minus L applied to rho divided f prime squared. Oops. <coughs> so it's very nice because you, sh you see that uh, we have this condition of expansivity. So the derivative is bigger than lambda. So it means that 1 over the derivative is smaller than 1 over lambda. So it means that if I start with some rho that has a peak, it's very big, when I apply this operator, this will be brought down by a factor 1 over lambda. And then I pay a price here that is more or less fixed because this is kind of. So, but I have to make this, so this inequality looks very nice, but I have to make it a little bit more useful. So the simpler way to do it is to integrate it. So I just take the L1 norm of that, but uh, I need some space. Mm. Okay, this one you remember, so maybe I can raise it. So first of all, I would like to know how the L1 norm acts. So if you want to know how the L1 norm acts, then you just look at uh, L rho, and you take the L1 norm. And uh, since this is a sum, this is less or equal than L. This now is just any function, right? Uh, here, I should be careful. I started with the idea that I'm looking at what happened to density. But now, you see, since I want to understand something about uh, this operator, then essentially I want to investigate the spectrum of this operator. And if I want to investigate the spectrum of this operator, I have to act on vector space, not on space of positive function, right? So now I have to think that this is just a fu any function. So it's not necessarily a density. But then I will apply it to density. But now it's just any function. So, uh, of course, if this is positive, then this is inequality. But in general, it is an inequality. It's just because here there is a sum, so I bring the sum inside. And now, by definition, this is like, so this is like time 1. And this is like 1 composed f. Because that was my definition of the transfer operator, you see? The transfer operator is just the adjoint of composing with the dynamics. So here I can imagine that this is the transfer operator applied to this time, the function one, but this is like the fu this uh, function and one composed with the dynamics. But that, that is one. So this means that this is, that means that the operator contracts in L1. Okay, so I just discovered that So there is some contraction in L1. That is kind of nice. And now that I know that, I can integrate this stuff. So I can take the L1 norm of the derivative. And this is less or equal than what? Well, you see, here I, here I have an absolute value. I can bring the absolute value inside, so it's less or equal. This one is smaller than lambda to the minus 1. And then I get the L1 norm of the derivative using the fact that there's a contraction in L1, the operator. Because here I would get the, the L1 norm of the operator applied to this. But since it is a contraction, it is just smaller than one norm of this. And then I have this part. And this part, there is, oh, sorry. Ah, 
nobody told me anything. But of course, if I take, I, yeah, this, uh, okay. This is my mistake, sorry, I copied this mistake from my student. I mean, I forgot to, to take, uh, when you take the derivative of this, of course, you have the square, and then you have the second derivative of f. So I forgot to write. Okay. Right. But it doesn't matter. This one, since I assume that, ah, I erase this. I assume that the dynamics is C2, and now you see why I did so. Because in this estimate, the second derivative of the dynamics appear. So since I assume that the dynamics is in C2, then this is just bounded by some constant. And then if this is bounded by some constant, then I have that this is less or equal than this constant time del one norm of L rho, but since I have this, this is less or equal than B del one norm of rho. Okay. So now I get these inequalities. Okay. Now these inequalities in, in, uh, in dynamical system are called uh, lazota York. Okay. But uh, people in probability maybe would call them Dublin Forte because they appear before in, concept of in context of Markov chain, similar inequality. But, uh, so, but let me just change a little bit the inequality because this is... Uh, you see, is the delta norm of the derivative, but uh, it's clear since you have this, then uh, that uh, uh, you can write this as the uh, W11 norm. And this is the same. Well, maybe there is a different constant now. So the W11 norm, it means, of course, that if I have a function rho, W11 is equal to the L1 norm of the derivative plus the L1 norm of rho. Okay. So from the one that I got before, since you have this, you can get that is more or less the same. Sorry. There was a prime missing that I just left there. Okay, so now you see this has the following structure. There are two norms. One is weaker than the other. And the strong norm, which is in this case the W11 norm, contracts up to, up to a mistake that is given by the weak norm. Okay. So that is kind of a, of a situation in which one always tries to arrive in this game, some way or another. And uh, uh, there is an extra uh, property that here is very simple, that you look at the operator L, as an operator that goes from the strong space to the weak space, and you want this to be compact. Okay, this is kind of obvious in this case because the unit ball of W11 is compact in L1, so this is true. So you have uh, this general situation that uh, 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 you get, and uh, now there is some theorem. It's a theorem due to Anion, which says the following. So maybe I, wrote, I write the theorem on the opposite. So this is. There are very version, very many versions of this theorem. Actually, you can prove it using the analytic Fredholm alternative or some other. I mean, but uh, the point of view is that uh, the. Um, uh, Anion version is particularly nice because it does have very little, um, very little uh, uh, hypothesis. In particular, it does not require the Banach space to be separable. So my first reaction was, uh, this is ridiculous. So when uh, is, uh, is ever going to happen that you get a non-separable non Banach space? But then you just start to work with L infinity and BV, and then you are in trouble immediately, right? So. Uh, so the fact that the Banach space does not need to be separable is kind of useful. So the theorem of Anion is, is abstract. It just says, imagine that you have two Banach spaces, B and B weak, and you have uh, uh, an operator and uh, L from B to itself, it's also from B weak to itself. Also, is an operator that you can see it from B to itself. 
So you can restrict it. So this is weak in the sense that one is contained in the other, right? So this space is like uh, W11 is contained in L1, okay? So you have an operator that is defined here. Of course, this operator is well defined. See, I never discuss where this operator is defined. I just define it on small, on smooth function. But it's clear that once you see this, it's obvious that you can define it as an operator in L1 because you just take any function in L1, you approximate it. But, but anyhow, I mean, it's, 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 and then you get uh, that is a bounded operator. So you, you can extend it to L1. So now you have this operator on L1, and uh, which is exactly this. The operator is also defined by B in itself, in, in that I checked, I see. This inequality tells me that if this is in W11, so this is in W11, so that's okay, I can extend it to that. And, uh, and then L as an operator from B to BW is compact. And plus, I have these inequalities. The inequality are, it's a little bit more general, the theorem, but let me just make it simple. So it's power bounded, and which is the case because, uh, sorry. Which is exactly the first inequality over there. And the second one is that in the strong space, this is less or equal than some constant lambda to the minus n rho in the strong space plus some other constant rho in the weak space for some lambda strictly larger than one. And that is exactly the second inequality over there. So this hypothesis covers exactly the case that I just discussed. And the conclusion of the theorem is that then L is quasi-compact. And uh, uh, the, spect the essential spectrum of L is contained in a disk uh, of size uh, uh, lambda minus one. So it means that here, in this case that I'm looking at, I have the following. Spectral radius is one, you can see it from here. So This is lambda minus one. This, in principle, I don't control. Maybe all essential spectrum. Outside, there are, I mean, let's say that now I take a slightly bigger circle. This is lambda minus one plus epsilon for each epsilon. Then outside of this slightly bigger circle, I have only finitely many eigenvalue of finite multiplicity. So it means that uh, if you have the little uh, uh, kind of idea to consider this operator not on L2, but as an operator acting on W11, so this is the spectrum on W11 of L. So this also was not very the spectrum, essential spectrum, but in B, okay? So if you have the spectrum of this operator in, uh, in W11, then the spectrum of this operator looks very much like a matrix in a Markov chain because it has a peripheral part that is essentially a matrix, finite eigenvalue of finite multiplicity, and then there is some shit over there that is small, so it should not matter. That is... That is, when you iterate, it will go to zero very, very fast. So it's okay. So that is the, the problem. Yeah? Okay, that is exactly what you are uh, ahead of, of me. Uh, that is exactly the first problem because, in principle, there are two problems that can arise. First of all, 
Here there, should, here there is an eigenvalue. Why there is an eigenvalue? Well, because uh, this is the dual operator of the composition with uh, uh, the dynamics. And if you compose one, one composed with the dynamic is one. So it means that one is an eigenfunction of the composition. So it has eigenvalue one. The dual must have also the same eigenvalue. So one is in the spectrum, OK? And uh, now it could be that this guy, it is not simple. So if this guy is simple, it means, so this, so this one is eigenvalue one. It would have some eigenvectors. So, they, so it will be something like that. There is, you know now that there is some, let me write it here. There is some rho star such that L rho star is equal rho star. And this answers your question. And this one belongs to W11. Okay, if you work more, you can show that this is in one, but I mean, this is just a cheap way of. So now you know that there is an invariant density. So this corresponds to an invariant measure. No, because of course, if you have rho star phi compose f, this is equal to L rho star phi, and this is equal to rho star phi. So this is an invariant measure. So now you know that you have invariant measure for your system, and this invariant measure is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. Okay, so it starts to look in shape, this business. But of course, as uh, Herbert was saying, you have to look at the peripheral spectrum, so the spectrum on the unit circle. If this one is not simple, then it means that there is another one. But then it means that the dynamical system, F uh, rho star dx, it means that this is not ergodic. Because if it is ergodic, then there cannot be any other <coughs> measure that is absolutely continuous with respect to this. And it's easy, so if you work a little bit, it's easy to find that this is always positive. So it is actually equivalent to Lebesgue. So that means that you have to look at your system, and you have to check that it's ergodic with respect to Lebesgue. So this requires, but this is kind of obvious, right? Because uh, things, uh, if you take a small interval, this gets blown by the dynamics. It gets bigger and bigger after some time. It covers everything, so it's kind of not so hard to show that it's not possible that, um, because, uh, yeah, it's not possible that uh, uh, you have uh, two invariant measures uh, in existence. Okay, fine. And uh, so now you'll need a topological argument to show that this is a simple eigenvalue. Once you know that this is a simple eigenvalue, still there is a problem. There could be other eigenvalue over here. But this is a positive operator. So it's easy to show that uh, if there are eigenvalues, then there must be a subgroup of, uh, um, they must form a group. So there are some maybe finite. So if there is an eigenvalue here, e to the i theta, then there should be e to the 2 i theta, and uh, maybe e to the 3 i theta, and then, uh, I don't know, e to the 4 i theta, and then maybe this is, this is also, so maybe if theta is pi over 6, then. But the point is that, so it, they must form a group. If there is one, there are also the other. But now this means that this must be a rational, uh, theta must be p over q times pi. Because otherwise, when I do the group, I will just fill the circle. But this is not possible, because then the circle will be, uh, would have accumulation point of eigenvalues. But I know that this is not essential spectrum, so the eigenvalue must be isolated. So it means that it is possible in principle that there is a, a cycle in the dynamics. Like something get, an interval get mapped here, then get mapped there, then get mapped there, and then get mapped back to itself. But if you think a moment, this is expanding, it's not possible. Uh, so because it means that in, in this case in which pi theta is equal to pi over three, then what do you get? You get that you can take F6, and then it would mean that F6 is not ergodic. But F6 is just an expanding map. So if expanding map are ergodic, then F6 would be ergodic. And then, uh, so it means that there cannot be anything here. But, if the, but now you are in business, because it means this is simple eigenvalue. Here there is nothing. 
Here they are discrete, so there is a spectral gap. So if you have a spectral gap, now you are exactly in the same exact situation that you have for Markov chains. Absolutely the same. And, <coughs> and so what does it mean? It means that the your operator L, your operator L has a spectral decomposition as such. It will be some rho star which is the invariant density, absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue, unique, there is no other, the integral of rho plus some operator Q time rho. This is the operator that is associated to the rest of the spectrum. There is some disk that contain all the other eigenvalue. So if you take this part of the spectrum, this is associated to a spectral decomposition that is the projector on this guy plus this part. So if you take power n, since this is a spectral decomposition, it will look like this. But q to the n in w1, as an operator on w11, this will be smaller than some constant times some nu to the n for nu smaller than 1. Nu is just... The, depend from the gap between the leading eigenvalue, which is one, and the second leading eigenvalue that you don't know what it is, you have to compute it, it depend case by case. Okay, so once you have that, situation is finished because you can say, ah, okay, but then, but then here, I know that I get epsilon square, sum over i that goes from epsilon minus 2, and then I use the spectral decomposition, so this will be just rho star. Now this is a probability density, so this is 1, and then I get um, time, uh, so rho star phi uh, plus something that is of order nu to the uh, i. Okay. So of course, this will just converge to rho star which is what I call their new <coughs> okay. So now you know what it means to be zero average. If this is zero, this is the equivalent of the case that I had at the beginning in which uh, the uh, increments, which are this thing, there I, told, I, I remind to you that this now plays the role of, in the Lorentz gas, the increment from going from one cell to the other. But uh, since uh, there, for the Lorentz gas, uh, the invariant measure is Lebesgue, and uh, so if you change V with minus V, you uh, get the same dynamics, just go backward in time, but it's indistinguishable because the system is reversible. Then it means that with respect to Lebesgue, V is, of course, uh, uh, zero average. I mean, the increment is zero average. So, if you want to do a mod in this very simple model of an expanded map, you get a situation similar to the one that I was discussing before for the Lorentz gas, then you have to assume that this is zero average, correspond to the fact that you are considering. <laughs> and now if this is zero average, now you can say very well, but then what about the CLT? Ah, sorry, there is one, uh, sorry, I remember now that I promised to discuss uh, the type of convergence there. Okay, if you want to, okay, let's just discuss the type of convergence. Now, you know that uh, since it's zero average, you converge to zero, okay? And now you want to know if you converge to zero almost surely or, or no, because this is just convergence in law, right? So, but uh, what you can do, you can just compute del 2 norm now. This is kind of a stupid computation, but it just to show you how this paradigm that, in fact, I think as if it was a Markov chain works, because this is exactly the same proof that I would do for a, a probabilistic system. I just look at the expectation of epsilon 
uh, square sum i that goes from 0 up to epsilon minus 2 of phi xi. And I take the square. And this is what? This is the sum of i and j from 0 to epsilon minus 2, epsilon to the 4. And then I have the integral uh, I, I have now. Let's do it just to make things. Well, it doesn't matter. So I have rho. And then I have phi uh, compose fi, phi compose fj. OK? And um, now I have epsilon to the 4. So now I have two possibilities, of course, now. So I just have the case in which i is equal to j, which is just uh, phi squared times fi. So I can put it on the other side, li. And then I have twice the case in which uh, one is bigger than the other. So this is just to say j smaller than that. And then in this case, I have rho, and then I have uh, uh, phi compose phi i minus j phi. And then here will be compose phi j that I put it on this side. And now you see what is going to happen. What is going to happen is that, OK, these are just uh, epsilon minus 2 term, but it's epsilon 4. So this is order, this first term is order epsilon, uh, epsilon square. And uh, here, instead, I have, in principle, uh, epsilon uh, to the minus 4 terms. But uh, this sum, when uh, it is clear that when i is uh, uh, larger than j. I here, you see, I have a situation in which, um, let me just do the case in which this one is exactly the invariant measure, which will happen very soon. Because you see, you apply this operator to this guy, as soon as j is a little bit big, this will be essentially rho star. So essentially, this is like rho star. Well, you can, I mean, I'm just, don't want to do all the detail, but this is just rho star, and then you have this compose phi, uh, let's say it's called this k, phi. And now you just, uh, again, use, you get phi, and then you get L to the k, rho star phi. OK? And uh, now, when k is large, this, where is it going to, uh, uh, where it is going to, to, to go? It is going to go to the projector on the maximal eigenvalue, which is 1, plus a very small term. So this is going to, to be essentially, for large k, is going to be uh, the integral of phi times rho star. And then here you get uh, the average of this, which is against phi rho star. But this is 0. You see, this is decay of correlation. This thing is going to go to this thing. But this is 0 average. So essentially, all these terms will be exponentially small, but uh, kind of uh, the first few. So this sum, again, gives you only epsilon minus 2. So everything is order epsilon minus 2. You just have to use it. It's the same computation that you do for a Markov chain. It's absolutely the same. So uh, and now you have that. Uh, you, you can just uh, prove uh, by Chebyshev inequalities that almost surely you get the low large number. This is just as exactly as you do for uh, in, in any probability book. So, OK, so this is uh, kind of um, the uh, introduction of, uh, of this uh, point of view. And of course, uh, let me just make a, a small remark that uh, this, you know, I just mentioned before this other example. I mentioned this example in which the dynamics was just some matrix.
on the torus. And, uh, and now you see that this naive point of view will not work for this one. Because, OK, this is true, fine. But uh, once you try to take the derivative, the problem is that uh, this is uh, you're taking the derivative of a function phi composed with f minus 1. So essentially, the derivative will be just multiplied by this, this matrix. But uh, the inverse of this matrix has an eigenvalue that is strictly bigger than 1 and an eigenvalue that is smaller than 1. So the inverse has also an eigenvalue that is strictly bigger than 1. So it means that if I look at the norm of uh, the derivative, this will be actually in generally bigger than uh, the derivative. Well, this is just a gradient, right? Than the gradient of phi in L1. This, in, in general, there is no, sometimes it can be smaller, but in general, you can find easily the direction in which this is the case. So it means that the derivative grows because the, there is a direction in which the dynamics contract, so the inverse dynamics expand. So that is a serious problem that has kind of stuck this point of view for um, ages. But finally, people understood how to fix it, so I will say something about it in the but. But first, first before going to that, I would like to uh, look at uh, this problem, which was the plan for the lecture of today, was to show how to uh, handle this problem, which the technique uh, uh, can be applied in order to study how this converts to Brownian motion. But of course, I have finished my time, so this I will say tomorrow. Uh, but uh, just to just tell you uh, some little preview, like in movie that at a certain serial, that at the end of the serial, they you know, tell you what will happen in the next uh, episode. So maybe you are going to watch it, or maybe not, because you don't even like the preview, because your nice character died, or something like that. So now, the point is that I will just um, explain the three possible way of attacking this problem. One is uh, a trick that is due, I think, to Gordon. And it is a martingale approximation. So you just try to take this quantity and see it as a martingale plus a co-boundary. And then if you succeed in doing that, of course, you can use the CLT for martingale. The other one is a trick that it is due to, I don't know, I think to Givarsh and Ayrdin, or maybe it existed before, I don't know. That I learned it from them. And the idea is that you can take this transfer operator here and uh, uh, twist it with the potential, which has to do with the function phi, and uh, with a complex potential. And then, using perturbation theory for this complex potential, you can compute uh, uh, the characteristic function of uh, this quantity. And so you compute directly the characteristic function, and this gives you very strong result. For example, then makes it very easy to compute, for example, local limit theorem, or even Edgewood expansion, stuff like that. This is, it's very powerful when it works, but it doesn't work always. And uh, uh, finally, there was this other thing that this, uh, as I said, this is just the quantity at time one. But maybe you want to see all paths, right? You want to converge to Brownian motion. This is just central limit theory. So if you want to converge to Brownian motion, there are various strategies. But there is one strategy that is particularly, I think, nice, that uh, is due to, um, essentially, to Dolgo Piat. And uh, it is kind of copying. Uh, this um, uh, martingale problem uh, by Baradan, uh, Struck, uh, I mean, that is just looking at, uh, at uh, uh, the, uh, like, like looking at the measure in path space and show that the limiting measure satisfies some martingale problems that has a unique solution, and the unique solution is the Brownian motion. So that is kind of three way of handling the problem. They are, as I announced, all copied by probabilists, so um, probably. Probably there is nothing interesting for probabilists, but it's kind of interesting that this kind of idea can be applied to dynamical system. And the, always the motor of this application is always rest always in this spectral picture, that you can somehow are able to see that uh, the operator, even though at first sight it's a bad operator, nevertheless, if you look at it in the proper way, it has some spectral gap. OK, I think that is enough for the day. Sorry.